Welcome to July Asset News, the top stories in cryptocurrency digital assets, and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we've got some good news, even though it looks bad. First up, 1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin from Mt. Gox hack might spook crypto markets, and this is exactly what I'm praying for. Also, Peace and Market Watch had me wondering, where it states half of Americans over 55 may retire poor. There's two things. First of all, it's a lie, because they're not going to retire poor or may retire poor. It should say, they will retire poor. And the next big question is, how is that going to affect everybody globally as far as the other people who are 55 and over in other countries? But first, let's break into the market. So today, it is Monday, October 5th, and it's about 1 o'clock p.m. Texas time. And what do we got? Well, pretty good news, actually. Bitcoin is almost at 10.7, went up 0.6% in 24-hour time frame. Again, I'm very impressed with what's going on in the market, uh, especially with BitMEX legal issues, plus the President of the United States getting uh, coronavirus. Uh, these two different things, they were talking about going to crash the market. I said I could either do one of two things, little dip or big dip. And it looks like it just be a little dip and uh, not too bad. If this would happen in 2017, we would have crashed to the ground. So uh, I believe this market is uh, roaring and is going to do big things over the next one to two years. Also, Ethereum ah, is at 350. It's, it's still above, so we're pretty happy. Tether's Tether, <laughs> about a dollar. XRP, 25 cents. Watch out, almost 25. Finance Coin still in that number five position, but I just saw a story about their portfolio of DeFi projects had lost like 50% of their value. So uh, not too good for uh, just Binance, the actual exchange. Binance Coin, hey, not too bad, up 8.3% for the week. But uh, the exchange, eek. Bitcoin Cash down almost a point. Polkadot up 1%, 417. I like to see that. Chainlink has dropped below 10. Wah, wah. Crypto.com up 0.7. Let's see, is there anything fantastic to report? Because the rest of this is kind of boring. NEM 9.5. That's pretty good. I don't know why. Hey, whoever owns NEM, congratulations. I don't own any of that. Wrap Bitcoin 0.4, yeah, sure. Zcash up 1.8. And if you didn't know, uh, Gemini just got the go ahead to allow for private transactions with Zcash from their uh, exchange. And they actually went through, the, through uh, New York State. So kudos to them actually getting that going. Oh man, Uniswap down 11%, son of a gun, 330. OMG Network up four, Ugh, Celsius down six, but still uh, at, at over $1.25. Congratulations, Celsius holders. I can't hold on uh, much of it because I'm in Texas. I don't know how it works in the rest of the United States, but uh, I can't gain interest on, on cell, uh, to get Celsius. I have to get it in dollars or Bitcoin. Uh, but I wish I would have gotten Celsius. Unfortunately, my state doesn't allow that. And uh, that's pretty much about it. So um, not a bad day considering all the things that are happening. So let's just jump into the big story. First up, I see these headlines about Mount, Mount Gox, and I'm always like, who cares? I, I, I just don't get it. But uh, 1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin from Mt. Gox might spook crypto markets. I mean, I get the whole thing about if they're going to dump a bunch of Bitcoin on people who had invested in this back in like 2013, 14, whenever the, when the hack was. So they're going to sell a bunch. And for me, I'm like, great, sell it all you want, because guess what I'm going to do? <laughs> I've got money in the bank and I'm just waiting for you guys to get rid of it so I can gobble it up. But whatever you want to do, uh, that's fine with me. So here's a little backstory. Uh, there was a Japanese-based exchange called Mt. Gox, and uh, it was said to have handled over 80% of all Bitcoin transactions in its early years. Well, guess what happened? Uh, in 2014, ah, that's right, 2014, uh, almost a million Bitcoin or 740,000 Bitcoin was hacked and uh, it all just went away. But it led to the exchange going bankrupt, which makes a lot of sense because when you lose that much Bitcoin, you can't come back from that. I don't care what year it is. Now it says, while 200,000 Bitcoin were eventually recovered, that's amazing, uh, the whereabouts of the remaining 650 remain a mystery. Hold on. Let me see here. Let me do some quick math. If you get 650 plus 200, I'm pretty sure that's 850,000. But it says here that 740,000 Bitcoin were hacked in 2014. So maybe someone could correct that in the comments section. I'm not for sure. But let's just say this. A lot of Bitcoin was lost. However, under Japanese law and case coverage available here and here, creditors were liable to receive a chunk of their lost funds at massively inflated prices, which, you know, it's pretty good, right? I mean, if you invest all the way back then, and then wouldn't that suck if you invested all the way back then and you were looking at 2017 December going, wow, 
There goes Bitcoin, almost 20,000. Wish I would have had, you know, my 100 that I invested into Mt. Gox, but of course it got hacked. That would have sucked. States here, the funds were earlier supposed to be returned on July 1st. This is, they're going to give this back to all the different investors. So it's supposed to go back on July 1st, but a court hearing delayed it to an October date, which is October 15th. So we're looking at 10 days. It's, it's going to go back. But here's my question, everybody. I cannot find an answer for the life of me. So if you had 200,000 returned, right? And there was whatever this number is, let's just say 600,000. So 600,000 is supposed to be returned back to people. And they're going to give back roughly 150,000 in this in this one. Yeah. Under the terms of creditors are said to cumulatively receive over 150,000 Bitcoin. So this story keeps coming up. And it seems like every time I read it, it's like, all oh, these you know, these people that got hacked, they're going to get all this Bitcoin. It's going to crash the whole market. Well, it never really does. But I'm just, I'm just saying to myself, I'm like, well, how many times is this going to happen? Is, there has to be like a limit when these people actually get all their Bitcoin back. Because if you lost around 600000 there should be a point where it's like, okay, you guys are paid off. Now go away. Do whatever you want. So help me in the comment section to, because uh, I could not find how much is left to give back. Is this the last installment or we're going to have like 20 more of these things? So it seems like these stories come out like every six months. States here, while some of these creditors may choose to hold, others will sell for a profit over 300%. Yeah, I think so. And this is where it always gets funny. I I just love it when these when these uh, publications, they start to quote uh, these different people's names. And, you know, anonymous popular Twitter account, Mr. Whale, Joe Blow, John Gunn. It's just, it just sounds so ridiculous, but I mean, it is what it is. Uh, meanwhile, Mr. Whale, an anonymous Twitter account, states this. If 150,000 Bitcoin is sold in the market, it would cause a brutal drop and fear would quickly spread across the market. So that's pretty much it. The rest was boring. The, the, the whole thing coming out of this, I'm, I'm praying and I'm hoping that all these people sell because I want them to sell and I want the market to go down. Uh, the you know We just saw the, the price of Bitcoin. I'm hoping it goes down below 10,000. That would be fantastic. And if it goes below nine, even better. Uh, because when I'm looking at this, I'm just an investor. I'm not a trader. So when things start to go down, I get pretty excited. I, I didn't used to because I used to dump. I mean, when I first got in 2017, I dumped a bunch of money in and I should not have done that. I should have just dollar cost average like I do now. And then when all these dips happen, I don't have this, you know, like this crushing tightness in my chest going, shoot, I just lost 30%. I can go, hey, I got money on the sidelines. I'm ready. So if you believe that Bitcoin's going to go up, this is actually huge. So if you look at like uh, this was just came out uh, today. This is from Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg Professional Services and their analysts have said, hey, Bitcoin's on track for 100,000 in 2025. Now, that's very conservative. If we just, let's just stick to a conservative number, 100,000 in 2025, but it's not just them. They also, there's another one, Asset Manager for ARK Investment, said that Bitcoin could reach a 3 trillion market cap by 2025. So again, they're talking about the same type of year, 2025, sure, whatever. Um, if you believe in this one or Tim Draper, where his assessment is it's going to be 250,000, uh, I believe Bitcoin is going to go somewhere north of 100K. That's all I can say. If you have a $3 trillion market cap here, that's around $160,000 per Bitcoin as it stands right now. And then if you take a look down here, and they go from $3 trillion all the way up to $5 trillion. And this is actually from Adam Back. He is the um, CEO of Blockstream. He's a big Bitcoin uh, maximalist. And he said that's pretty conservative. He agrees with this whole thing. He says, hey, could be a, a trillion dollar market cap within two years probably sooner and again that is a super super conservative uh type of number just in 2017 when we were just all on vaporware and white paper uh it was the entire market cap was 850,000 850, yeah 850 billion excuse me so it was almost at a trillion but that was of course uh, Bitcoin still had a major dominance, but that wasn't everything. Of course, that was Bitcoin and XRP and Ethereum and all the different low caps. But uh, Bitcoin was a large uh, part of that, maybe 65, 70%. Can't remember. Someone correct me in the comment section. But to get to a trillion, I don't see it uh, being that big of a deal. And for 50K to come around, sure. Let's make it the most conservative you can possibly think of. If Bitcoin goes down, to below 10,000 and you can pick it up for that amount whatever it is you could 5x your your investment in 1 to 2 years and try doing that anywhere else especially in the stock market especially what's going to happen with the stock market pretty soon uh, if you believe all the different predictions so i mean there's no other way that you can possibly do that anywhere else
even land and real estate investment, uh, pretty darn tough to 5X everything. Or if you wanna look at like 100,000, 10X, or 250,000, 25X, just very hard to do. So let me know what you think in the comments section, which leads me to the next article, which is half of Americans over 55 may retire poor. And I, I'd like to take that may retire poor and just say will retire poor, because I believe that totally to be true. I'm gonna tell you exactly why. So this is actually an opinion piece this is from Howard Gold. He's one of the writers there for Market Watch. And he just invests or he just interviews a couple of economists. And one of them is economist Teresa Gilarducci, a professor at the New School, the New School in New York City. I don't know if that's right. And one of the nation's leading experts on retirement. And she said that half, that's right, half of Americans age 55 will retire in poverty or near poverty. She states our data is showing that because of the COVID uh, recession, about 50% of workers over the age of 55 will be poor or near poor when they reach 65 years old. And then they define what actually poor is if they're living on less than 20,000 a year. She told me, I think that's what we could all agree that means chronic deprivation for the rest of your life. Now, I don't know where exactly that you are. Some places, $20,000 is a boatload of money. And some places, it's not that much. So it just really just depends on your cost of living, where you're at, and what are your needs at that point. And the author goes on to say something kind of odd. He says, uh, if this happens, it would, it would reverse decades of progress toward eliminating poverty among the elderly. So uh, it just got me confused because if you don't know, uh, military, I was, I was in the military, medic, became a nurse, did a lot of things with, with home health care. And this was like when I, when I was in my 20s. Uh, now I'm in my late 40s and I can just tell you that all those years that I spent over there, I would see nothing but poverty. Uh, there was the majority of our patients were either... Uh, I mean, everybody has, you know, Medicare at that point, but a lot of our patients were on Medicaid. And Medicaid, if you're not familiar in, in America, uh, when you reach a certain level or cannot maintain a threshold of a certain amount of income, you can be put on a healthcare service called Medicaid and it's for low income individuals and it covers a lot of things and it's really a lifesaver or a raft for a lot of people. And what I would see as time went on, I would just start to see that the patients that I, that I was seeing was starting to get poorer and poorer and poorer and the things that they were able to afford wasn't that much. And I just didn't see what this guy's seeing uh, as far as like uh, reverse decades of progress towards limiting poverty. I saw nothing but poverty. And it was pretty sad to see uh, people who were at this point in their life where they should be, you know, having that, they're living out their golden years. They were literally just what you, what you uh, I've heard before, deciding between do I pay for uh, food or do I pay for this blood pressure pill? And I've had many a discussion with different patients about what they should do. Now, we would work with social workers and they, that, that's not the point. The point is, is that we would see a lot of poverty and it's on the rise. That's all I can say. It goes on. So what's behind this? People losing their jobs and health insurance because of COVID-19 or losing the employer matching their 401k contributions or having to tap into retirement savings to cover all these expenses. And the economist says it's all the above. It starts with job losses. Older workers are losing their jobs at a faster rate relative to younger people. And that's the thing. I mean, if you are a corporation, a business, and you got an option here to hire somebody who is, and there is this thing called ageism. Uh, you cannot discriminate based on age, sex, color, religion, everything like that. But it happens all the time. If a corporation says, hey, we have a job opening, and we have a person who's maybe a little older in middle management, we can move them up, but we're going to have to pay them more, or we could pay somebody uh, maybe 30% less who is uh, young, younger and hungry and can do a bunch of different things. Some, a lot of times they hire the younger person because they can uh, get away with it and they can pay less. And that's the whole thing about corporations. It's the bottom line. And that's the problem. I mean, if you're waiting for um, your retirement, your pension to, to cover you, those are the old days. Those days don't exist anymore. It's very rare to see pensions kind of come about. And then we're talking about, you know, personal finances. It's very, because you're going to have to dip into all those things. You're going to need a lot of money as you get older. That's the big thing. And when older workers lose their jobs, they lose access to savings. They lose their employer's contribution and they face a temptation of drawing down their retirement assets. And it's the same thing that I would see all the time. They're like, well, I'm going to dip into my retirement, dip into my retirement. Now what happened? They're talking about contribution to 401k. When I was going through, they would contribute, you know, a pretty good chunk. Uh, it actually, they would match me one-to-one. -one. Whatever I put in my 401k, they would match. This is different companies that I worked for over the years. But they, there's a statistic here. It said in 2009, 20% of employers stopped contributing to the 401k. So the employers, so they wouldn't match you. 
But now, over 50% of employers have stopped contributing to the 401k because they learned they can get away with it. I don't know if that's really a wise practice because, as I understood it, you could contribute to the 401k and it would be like a tax uh, write-off, but maybe not. I guess these companies want to save as much money as they possibly can. Anyhow, here's one of the problems that I see. Because of the retirement accounts that are out there, especially like your 401ks or your IRA or stuff like that, you cannot take or you cannot withdraw if you are under 59 and a half. So if you're 55 and just waiting for that time, if you take it out, you actually have a big penalty. But because of this CARES Act that was just uh, passed, they removed the 10% penalties on withdrawals up to 100,000 from those accounts for people under that age. So, but here's the big thing. It allows them to pay back the money over a three year period. And if you don't, you will get that 10% penalty put right back on. So this is one of those issues with like people going, hey, I can dip into my, my retirement accounts, my IRAs. No. I mean, you can, but you have to pay everything back within three years. And if you don't, you get you get penalized. So it's one of those things where like you're losing every time you take out your own money, which kind of sucks. So here's the, here's the recommendation from The Economist. She says, don't quit your job. If you're older and you're afraid of the virus, get a hazmat suit. And I was like, I read that and I go, oh my God, that is the worst. Just, can you imagine? I mean, you, you have to decide between your health or working. I mean, depending on where you're at, right? So it's just, and I've, it's, a, it's an awful decision to make. So this is what I'm trying to tell you. All these things that we just talked about, with talking about Bitcoin and the different opportunities that are available and the market that's going to, you know, potentially take a big dip, that's okay. Because that dips, then I'll have the ability to buy it up. And you don't have to buy up like tens of thousands of dollars. I'm not saying to buy one Bitcoin when it when it reaches nine thousand. That's nine thousand bucks. A lot of them. I can't do that. So I'm just saying, when it dips a little bit, what I will be doing is buying those little dips in small increments because I don't want to FOMO in and put a thousand dollars into it. Maybe it's a hundred bucks. Maybe it's twenty five. It's whatever you have. But the big thing here is not to lose sight of what it could potentially be. And that is the big thing. But there's another another part to this, and that is your taxes. And I've talked about this many a time. Let's say you're able to build a nice little nest egg of, let's say 500,000. You put in $50,000 over, over, over this, this time, over the next however much time it's taken you, and then it starts to balloon or inflate to half a million, or maybe even a even million dollars worth of cryptocurrency. So if that happens, guess what? guess what happens to you? you're going to get dinged and you're going to have to pay taxes on those capital gains taxes, uh, depending on how long it is. It could be sizable. Right now, it's between 15 and 25%. Right now. I don't know who's going to win the presidency coming up, but uh, expect it to change, especially with the quantitative easing, because you're going to have to tax people and you're going to, you're going to have to get revenue from some point. And it's not going to be just out of thin air again. It's going to be from people like you and me, who are paying a boatload of taxes. So this is what I'm afraid of. Also, on top of that, uh, for the next year, 2020, when you file your taxes, you're going to see this this uh, this little comment here, this thing I've been harping on before. If any time did you receive sell cent exchange or any kind of virtual currency, and if you don't say yes, uh, those exchanges that you go to, they got your information, they're going to send it to you. Do not shoot the messenger. I'm just saying that is what is happening. So I'm going to leave you with this. There is a video I made. It talks about not paying crypto taxes. I refuse to pay an exorbitant amount of taxes if I have the opportunity not to do so legally. And that's the big thing. So again, if you had a traditional IRA or you have an old employer plan like a 401k, 403b, TSB, 457, whatever it is, you can move it into a crypto IRA and you can do trades within it at uh, zero to, low, to no fees, which is pretty awesome. This is who I use personally. I trust capital. I put and I'm going to max out every year the maximum amount, which I believe is 6000 I think I've reached my threshold. So $6,000 I'm putting in and you can invest into these types of cryptocurrencies into an IRA because here's the thing. Once you put that money into it, let's say you put ten thousand dollars in a uh, in a cryptocurrency, whatever this is, and you say, "Hey, I'm putting in the whatever Ethereum," and Ethereum goes bananas, and all of a sudden you've got a million dollars worth of Ethereum. Well, guess what? You're gonna be taxed on all those gains. But if you do it with an IRA, you're not taxing those gains. And I talk about all those different options, the legal options, in this video. I'm gonna link at the very end. So to get a month for free. I have a link in the description of every one of my videos. It looks exactly like this. 
click on this link. It is an affiliate link, but you will get one month for free of iTrust Capital. And if you just have questions after you watch that, that video that I'm gonna leave, leave to you, just click right here and click schedule a call. They can do you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, however long it takes to answer all your questions and get through them, which is pretty amazing, right? Just to actually be able to talk to a live person, what well, actually happens here, which is fantastic. That's it for that. There are some different pitfalls that we just saw and we took a look at that article about retiring poor. Remember, it's not how much you make, it is how much you keep over the long haul. And that's why I talk about using a service, something like this with iTrust Capital. And look, there's other companies out there that do the exact same thing for a cryptocurrency, IRAs. It's just that I looked at other ones, I did not like them. And this is the one that I went with, and it's my personal choice. So I give you the option and you can check it out and do whatever you want to do. All right, so that's it for today's video. Thanks for sticking with me. But before we take off, I just want to do random shout outs. So thanks everybody who has signed up for Digital Asset News. Really appreciate it. Uh, here's Steve Ehrlich, could be the CEO of uh, Voyager. Who knows? Uh, Chris Castillo, PacBid, Crypto Fastland. That's a good one. Frankster, Joey Serena. Bill Ennis, Chuck C, Chuck C, I like that one, and then Dreamer. So thanks everybody for signing up. I really appreciate it. If you like those videos, I'm going to put two more up uh, that you could uh, check out. There's going to be one definitely I need to put up there, which was talks about no crypto taxes, which I think is important. And uh, that's it for today. So uh, thanks for sticking with me through the whole thing. Super appreciate it. Thank you so much. See you on the next one.